This discussion about the Liver King is unlike anything that has been published about him so far. I know that for sure because I've listened to all of them. Instead, this is a discussion about the following issues most men deal with on a daily basis. Self-worth, self-loathing, perception of strength versus real strength, feeling inadequate, the predominant feeling of powerlessness in men and boys. In the end, we'll discuss the important topic of role models, the idea of having a male role model for boys and young men, and the incredible task of being a role model for older men. So many men wish they had a male role model growing up and feel like they've been shortchanged if they didn't. Also, in the end, I'll talk about my personal connection to this story for the sake of full transparency. I'm Dr. Persia, as in the Empire, a former cancer scientist turned masculinity researcher. I'm the founder of the world's first and only company that provides gender-specific psychological risk management. I also run an educational company called Positive Masculinity Academy and a male-focused nonprofit organization called Feminists for Men. This podcast covers all the angles why globally 80% of all suicide deaths are men. We'll touch on areas where significant changes need to be made immediately to stop the silent crisis. This podcast is for all the good men who want to shine a light on healthy and positive masculinity by eradicating toxicity, courtesy of patriarchy. And for all the good women who wonder why men do what they do. For a more in-depth understanding of what this podcast is about, and why in the hell a woman is talking about men's issues, please check out our episode one. Thank you. The following groups are those who will get the most out of this important discussion. Teenage boys, men in their 20s and 30s, older men who consider themselves in a role model capacity, and last but not least, mothers of boys. Please send this podcast to anyone in those categories or anyone else who can benefit. The protagonist in this real life story is a gentleman named Brian Johnson, also known as the Lipper King. Who is he? The self proclaimed Liver King is a cartoonishly muscular, extremely hairy, and always shirtless 45 year old TikTok star named Brian Johnson, who amassed millions of followers in only a year or so by promoting his version of ancestral lifestyle, which includes a diet of beef brains, bull testicles, and raw animal livers. He's also a husband and a father of two teenage boys. This guy is passionate about nine ancestral tenets, a primal diet, and serious workouts multiple times a day. He has a few companies, and one of them, Ancestral Supplements, sells freeze-dried cattle organs and capsules. His message, theatrical appearance, and social media content made him one of the fastest breakout TikTok stars of 2022. He heavily promoted his lifestyle and products, and despite his comically overinflated muscles, he adamantly denied that he's ever used steroids. For those who don't know him, he recently uploaded an apology video on YouTube with over 3 million views at the time of this recording, because apparently his steroid dealer leaked his emails with Brian. So now we know he lied. He used steroids and eating raw liver and testicles didn't make his muscles as big as they are. Before we dig deep into the real issue, discussing his apology video is essential for context. In his apology video, the guy calling himself Liver King is sitting shirtless on a throne, which is a ridiculously gaudy chair. And he starts the video by calling the viewers primals. He is in full theatrical character 
while recording what should be a sincere apology video. Primals, I'm making this video to apologize because I fucked up, because I'm embarrassed and ashamed, because I lied and I misled a lot of people. Liver King, the public figure, was an experiment to spread the message, to bring awareness to the 4,000 people a day who kill themselves. The 80,000 people a day that try to kill themselves are people are hurting at record rates with depression, autoimmune, anxiety, infertility, low ambition in life. Our young men are hurting the most, feeling lost, weak, and submissive. So I made it my job to model, teach, and preach a simple, elegant solution called ancestral living, the nine ancestral tenants, so our people no longer have to suffer, so we can collectively express our highest and most dominant form. This is my fight. This is why I exist. He said Liver King, the public figure, was an experiment. Judging by his shirtless appearance on the throne, I would say that the experiment is still not over. He also said to bring awareness to the 4,000 people a day who kill themselves and the 80,000 people a day that try to kill themselves. So according to him, he's doing this experiment as an imaginary royalty, literally putting a Burger King type crown on his head in some of his social media posts and videos and always taking only a single bite out of a full-size raw animal liver is his way of bringing awareness to suicide. A quick fact check. According to World Health Organization, 703,000 people take their own lives globally each year, and many more attempt to do so. That makes for almost 2,000 people a day if I round it up. Not 4,000. And that's all people, not just men. Granted, most are men. It is impossible to know how many people attempt to take their own lives, since the overwhelming majority don't report it. So the 80,000 figure is also fictional. A quick check of his Instagram account showed that he constantly makes anecdotal claims and statistics because he speaks fast, with that thick voice, and with a reasonable degree of confidence. None of the interviewees challenge him. In one of them, he said there is a mattress that increases your estrogen production by sleeping on it. And the dum-dum sitting across from him didn't say a word. He also said our people are hurting at record rates with depression, autoimmune, anxiety, infertility, low ambition in life. He's right about that. But I don't understand how pumping his muscles with steroid is helpful towards these issues. He said... Our young men are hurting the most, feeling lost, weak, and submissive. This is where he starts to really lose me. Our men are hurting, not just young men. Recently, Stephen Boss, aka Twitch, the charismatic DJ and a co-executive producer on the Ellen DeGeneres show, took his own life at age 40, despite being handsome, successful, and having a beautiful family. In September 2022, the 52-year-old CFO of Bed Bath & Beyond, Gustavo Arnal, also took his own life by jumping out of his New York City high-rise apartment. Male suicide is high in teenage boys and young men, but it picks up again at age 55 and up. Men in their 70s regularly take their own lives. The two famous examples I just gave you were in the in-between low-risk group. Almost 140 men of all ages and all socioeconomic standings, take their own lives every day, just in the U.S., and the majority don't make the headlines. We see similar stats in Canada, the U.K., and almost every other country, but even higher in some countries such as Japan and Israel. I totally agree that this is a crisis. Still, it gets a lot more complicated, counterproductive, and actually harmful when Brian claims the problem is that they're feeling weak and submissive, and his solution is to model a dominant lifestyle. We'll discuss that later. Lastly, he said, so I made it my job to model, teach, and preach simple, elegant solution called ancestral living, the nine tenants, so our people no longer have to suffer, so we can collectively 
express our highest and most dominant form. This is my fight. This is why I exist. Lots to unpack here. Before he was outed, he'd go on podcasts, show off his muscles, berate anyone who said he was using steroids, take raw liver with him, have the hosts take a bite, and almost all of them would make a face and spit it out because it's so nasty and gross. Then he would take out his supplements, which are freeze-dried cattle organs and capsules, put them on the table and say, hey, if you can't eat it fresh and raw, then the next best thing is my supplements. Honestly, that's a brilliant marketing and sales pitch. As a capitalist, I appreciate that. But how is that your fight to save all the lost boys standing on the ledge? As a masculinity researcher, I have a problem with that. In none of those podcasts and interviews and posts, he ever mentioned anything about depression, suicide, wanting to help lost boys. And I heard all of that only after he was exposed for steroid use. I don't follow him on social media. I didn't even know he was out there like that. I was listening to John Stewart's podcast episode about the FTX in Sam Bankman Fried's fraud when Liver King was brought up first and how he lied about his steroid use. I almost fell off my chair. That name was familiar to me. And as I said, I'll talk about my personal connection to the story at the end. I quickly searched and found the apology video. Then I listened to three exhaustingly long episodes of him making a round on famous podcasts and explaining his lie. The first podcast was over an hour long of nothing but softballs, which was nonsense and helped no one. The guy's sidekick dared to ask a tough question about Brian making his wife lie for him, and the podcast host quickly intervened and stopped it. The second popular podcast was even worse. The host had three hype men sitting on a big couch along with him and Brian, and it was nothing but a juvenile comedy hour. Again, over an hour of trying to address the issue of lying. The host even tried to tell a personal story of his own and be vulnerable, but they were all so terrified of getting deep that their limit for vulnerability was about 20 seconds at most. After that, every time, the host would quickly crack a joke and the three hype men would go nuts, hyping it for two, three minutes. It was a mind-numbingly useless clown show. It was the textbook example of what Lewis Howes, in his book, The Mask of Masculinity, calls the Joker mask. They also downplayed the steroid use to normalize it. They kept saying, it's not a back alley injection. It's monitored by a clinician, like that was the problem. The third podcast was over two hours long. After talking about Brian's childhood for a little bit, the majority of the time was focused on his businesses and the host's apparent personal curiosity about steroid use. These three podcasts collectively have hundreds of thousands of listeners. I don't mind doing research for a podcast topic. But that was over five precious hours of my life that I'm never getting back. If Gen X and millennial men are this severely handicapped in talking about their real issues and struggles, terrified of getting deep, being vulnerable, and actually solving problems, then I guess baby boomers and millions of years of prior generations must be let off the hook by default. When modern men are gravely incapable of and terrified of vulnerability long enough to understand the depth of their misbehavior and have to either cut it off with softball questions or distract with clownish comedy jam or just focus on business and totally bypass the pain, then it makes sense why a man who dresses up like the naked Burger King mascot and calls people primals would become an overnight social media sensation then I can easily believe when he says countless 15-year-olds DM him and say, I wish you were my dad. Then the incredible success of Marvel Studios movies and the need to idealize fictional superheroes makes much more sense. The Liver King is pretty much a discount version of Thor and Captain America, who is far more accessible 
than Chris Hemsworth. Then the patriarch is glorified caricature of an ideal man, as a super alpha male, makes a lot more sense. When Benedict Cumberbatch wears a cape and gets paid millions of dollars to portray an imaginary superior male specimen, and Brian Johnson technically injects what's a poison in himself to feel what he thinks is a dominant male, then it's easier to understand why male-female suicide ratio is 4 to 1. One good thing from listening to these podcasts was finding out a bit about his childhood and the stories of how Brian was tortured in middle school by older boys who were taller, hairy, and physically stronger than him. The stories he told were gut-wrenching. The big bully would knock him out, and when he came to, his book bag was gone, the bell had already rung, no one was in the hallways, and he had to even figure out which period it was. This is horrific. I can't even imagine that kind of violence in schools. By the way, school bullying is not a global phenomenon. This is not how kids behave everywhere. Where I come from, Iran, this doesn't exist. There is no school bullying at all. Kids may get into a fight from time to time, but the systemic culture of bullying is non-existent. I learned about it for the first time in America. This is cultural, not biological and global. The trauma that Brian endured as a child is tragic. He said that when those big boys would start coming for him to beat him up, he would take a couple of steps back and tell them, you don't want to hit me, I'm a pussy. Translation, please don't hit me. There is no glory in this for you. This is not challenging. I'm inferior. Now we're getting into the territory of patriarchy and defining the strength in masculinity with violence, not to mention the good old boy misogyny defining women as the weak gender and pussy becomes the symbol of everything weak and pathetic. Deep trauma had caused his 11-year-old mind at the time of the abuse to conclude that strong means hairy, muscular, and domineering like those bigger boys. And if you're beaten, it means that you're a pussy and submissive. I don't blame an 11-year-old for coming up with that conclusion. But a 45-year-old still pretty much thinking the same way? Then no wonder he'll end up issuing an apology video after only a year of being social media famous. Unsurprisingly, Many comments on his apology video called him liver queen and liver girl as insults. When his entire understanding of strength is big muscles and his entire understanding of masculinity is domineering, which are patriarchal views, he attracts fans who share that, those views. So when he falls from grace, they ridicule him using his own language. So the almighty strong and dominant liver king becomes the inferior submissive liver queen. To these people, the notion of being a girl and a woman is inherently inferior. So to insult him, they call him liver girl, liver queen. He's only a symptom of the problem. When in one year he has millions of followers, those millions also have the worldview of a traumatized 11-year-old boy and his ideal of masculinity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a legit masculinity crisis. Understanding what's happening here is a careful dance between the culture of patriarchy, the association of the perceived strength in masculinity that is defined with violence, misogyny, the need for dominance, lack of a healthy home and school environment for a child, mental health, and unresolved childhood trauma. Our culture easily allows and justifies violence and creates space for bullying a middle school child. He's beaten, humiliated, and traumatized by bigger kids in an institution that is supposed to be a safe place for him to evolve and receive a quality education. On the other hand, our culture's idea of strength is big muscles and domination. How can we not expect the abused boys when they reach 18, 19, or 20 years old, to go and buy a military-grade weapon and shoot everyone at the school to show that they're not a pussy. When this is our culture of raising boys, we end up with 641 mass shooting just in 2022. And what do we do? We write a few angry posts about gun laws, 
on social media and the other side responds even angrier by defending guns and saying that guns don't kill people. Everyone sends thoughts and prayers, and then it dies down until the next abused boy gets to the age of AR-15. And now it's his turn to dominate. I'm not saying all school shooters have been abused, but they all want to show their dominance and be the manly man. Thankfully, Brian Johnson didn't shoot anyone, but he has chosen another destructive path for himself, his two teenage boys, and all the lost boys and men who are desperate for a strong male role model. This guy is a misguided and traumatized middle schooler in the body of a 45-year-old man with all the hair and the biggest muscles that his younger self could have dreamt of. Working out, getting physically bigger, and not allowing older boys to beat him up helped him survive his brutal bullying at the time. We've all had childhood trauma. I've never met anyone who hasn't. It's our job as adults to recognize and heal our childhood trauma and move beyond it, not to act it out in the most obnoxious way and perpetuate the trauma for the next generation because we're too scared to face the pain and walk through it. Overexercising, working 18 hours a day, obsessing over designer clothing, drowning yourself in education with multiple fancy graduate degrees making millions of dollars at the expense of sacrificing your family time and joy, going into debt to drive an expensive car, overextending your children and sending them to every imaginable extracurricular activity so you can strut them around like prized piglets, can also be forms of not dealing with your trauma. It's not always alcoholism and meth addiction. All these misbehaviors and external elements and the limited power they give us are a form of control in an effort to overcome or overshadow an internal sense of powerlessness. The need to dominate is solely the result of a deep feeling of powerlessness. Anytime a man brags about domination, it's his way of telling the world how deeply powerless he feels. When we teach our boys that the prowess in their masculinity is their ability to dominate, and that's the form of masculinity we value in society, we teach them to grab for anything outside themselves to feel temporarily strong, be it an AR-15, steroids, fancy cars, and rotate style, collecting women as possessions in religious polygamy or other forms of misogyny, just to name a few. This culture calls for men to relentlessly reach for something outside of themselves at any cost to replenish an ever-fleeing sense of internal and external worth. Brian said that he has to crush himself three, four times a day in the gym to feel like he's okay, he's worth it, and he earned it. Those are actually his words. When a man's worth is tied to his measure of masculinity, and his masculine identity is dependent on outside elements to help him feel powerful and dominant, then we have a masculinity crisis, evident by how quickly millions of men and boys flock to him in just a year of social media presence. The problem of insecure masculinity is one of our biggest challenges in society. Self-worth is challenging for all humans. But when one's worth is directly tied to his gender identity, which is conditional and earned, instead of given, then we have an army of men walking around with a deep sense of self-loathing and lack of self-worth. Next, we teach them to gain worth by dominating with possessions, muscles, violence, and women. Most men fall into this trap and create two groups. Group one, those who want to amass outside elements to fill the powerlessness void, but aren't really successful. These men are humiliated, ridiculed, and disrespected. They feel depressed, frustrated, and perpetually angry. A hallmark of these men is a deep sense of victimhood, and they get more bitter by the hour. Men's rights activists are a good example. The second group are those who grind to achieve the set parameters to fill the power void, 
after apparent achievement, these men are still angry and frustrated. Additionally, they're criticized by the public for being the rich guy, mocked for being physically massive, thrown in jail for violence, or labeled misogynists. Neither group wins, not in public and not in private. We're all born with adequate self-worth. That's why when babies experience any discomfort, they cry and scream loud enough to alert the whole neighborhood to come and pay attention to them. Toddlers eat with their hands, throw food across the table, and walk around and draw on the walls like they own the joint. But by the time we reach age five, the environment has crushed any sense of self-worth and value that we came to this world with. By the time we're older teenagers, not only we have no self-worth left, but we have also accumulated years of trauma, resulting in soul-crushing worthlessness, self-loathing, self-deprecation, emptiness, and powerlessness. And it's a lot worse for men, because their self-worth is culturally forced to detour through their masculine identities first, and then crashes into the same dump as the rest of ours. It's a double whammy for them. Let me tell you how internal power works. It's a byproduct of self-worth. When you have self-worth, you feel powerful. When you feel powerful, it leads to an unshakable sense of safety and security, which gives you internal peace, no matter what's happening in your life or the outside world. There's no amount of money, prestige, possessions, guns, supermodels, expensive houses, philanthropy, big muscles, fame, or political influence that can give you that. Your value as a human being cannot be conditional. It cannot come from the outside, meaning dependent on any of the things I just mentioned. You can't allow yourself to feel worthy because you're a good dad or a good provider or have made people laugh or have built an impressive structure or have been a good son. You can feel good about being a good son, but not make your self-worth conditioned upon it. Don't confuse the two. Michael Phelps is arguably one of the best athletes of all time. He has 28 Olympic medals, the highest in history. His unparalleled achievement didn't help him beat his depression and was suicidal for years. Thank goodness he overcame it, not by his strong muscles or gold medals or literally dominating the Olympics, but by strengthening his mind. Anthony Bourdain, 61, a successful chef who got paid millions of dollars to travel the world and taste the best food while winning eight Emmy Awards and a Peabody Award. After he took his own life, his mother said, he's absolutely the last person in the world I would have ever dreamt would do something like this. He had everything. Ernest Hemingway, also 61, an iconic author who won a Nobel Prize and a Pulitzer Prize for his novel The Old Man and the Sea, also took his own life. Personally, perhaps one of the biggest losses for me is Robin Williams, a comedy legend who won an Oscar for a dramatic role. He was good at everything. Also a four-time Oscar nominee and a philanthropist who co-founded the nonprofit organization Comic Relief USA, which has raised over $70 million to benefit the homeless. I don't know how much value I have in this universe, but I do know that I made a few people happier than they would have been without me. And as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever need to be. I'm one of those people he made happy, and I loved him for that. But his reliance on external validation regrettably didn't save his life. One of my favorite quotes is by Jim Carrey. I've often said that I wished people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame and so that they could see that it's not where you're going to find your sense of completion. Someday, at some point, you need to understand that no amount of achievement, domination, and outside validation will give you self-worth, internal peace, a permanent sense of safety, and self-love. But when you achieve true self-worth, that is unconditional and unshakable, there is nothing like it. Trust me, I know how it feels. It took me 11 years to achieve it.
I don't want to scare you, even though in the grand scheme of a lifetime, it's not that long, but I've always had a nagging feeling that I may have been a little bit more fucked up than the average Jane or Joe. Hopefully it'll take a lot faster for the most of you to achieve it. I'm not against success, wealth, fame, amazing cars, beautiful clothing, a sexy body, or making billions of dollars. As long as you know there are limitations and don't expect those things to give you what they can't, that wrong expectation is where people get in a lot of trouble. Let's move on to another important topic, the concept of role models. For some reason, boys and young men think they all should have a male role model, preferably at home, and especially of the same race and nationality as them to show them every step of the way what to do and guide them and protect them from harm. Many boys who are raised with their fathers around fantasize about someone else like the liver king to be their father because they think their own father is not perfect. Those who are raised without a father think only if they had one, he would have definitely been the ideal role model. Most boys and young men feel that only if they had that perfect, strong, manly man role model around to hold up the light and guide the way, they wouldn't be this lost and in pain right now. This is nothing but a fantasy, a fairy tale. There are no perfect role models out there. There is no way to avoid the pain. That's part of the human experience. The only way to deal with pain is to walk through it experience it and let it go. You don't necessarily need a role model in the first place. Many successful people have done well without it. Regarding role models, I agree that representation matters. But if there is no role model who perfectly represents you, then choose any human being of any gender, race, or nationality and look up to them. It's actually good to have more than one. Since perfection is a myth, you won't find someone you agree with in everything. And if you think you do, it's likely because you either don't know them personally or you have no sense of self developed yet. Just choose a few people that at least one thing about them inspires you. Study them and see where they started and how they ended up in a place that you now appreciate. Don't follow them step by step. Understand where they had problems and how they found solutions for them how they picked themselves up over and over and over again and moved forward. I was raised by a strong and good father. He's not perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. When I was a teenager, I was mad at him and thought some other dads were better. That's justifiably a childish thought process. Later, I realized he taught me things that no one else did. I appreciated that he's a faulty human being who tries hard to be an amazing dad. I see that now. For things he couldn't teach me, or I disapproved of his way of thinking, I simply chose other role models. Representation never mattered to me, and that's a personal experience. As a white Persian woman, I always looked up to Oprah Winfrey. The fact that she overcame abject poverty, was raised without good parents and a comfortable home, all the things I had, she achieved beyond anyone's wildest dreams and against all odds. She's black and American. Is that a representation of me? I never cared. I also looked up to Henry Ford. When I was a teenager, I read a quote of his, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I was fascinated by that. He inspired me to explore the concept of mindset and internal power on the outside. He didn't represent me either, but I wasn't distracted by that. If another human being could do it, so could I, period. I don't believe in a single role model or a role model for life. There are things that Henry Ford did that I don't like or approve. That doesn't negate the things about him that inspired me. I afford myself the luxury of picking what I like and leaving what I don't. If all your strength is in your muscles, you'll lose them, either in the absence of steroids or definitely with age. But a strong mindset is a gold mine with unlimited supply for life. Despite my fancy exterior, 
I've had as much shit thrown at me as anyone else, and have overcome all of them with remarkable strides by strengthening my mindset. I have crazy, unheard of stories to tell. There's a reason my nickname is Mindset Master. I'm stronger than a hundred liver kings stacked up on top of each other with my eyes closed, regardless of the fact that I have the upper body strength of a goddamn kitten. If you'd like to have a role model, may I suggest the great Muhammad Ali, the greatest boxer of all time? Do you want to have strong muscles? Wonderful. Look at his build. Unlike Liver King, Ali's physic is primal and unadulterated. Ali's muscular structure is a model of a naturally fit and strong man. What Liver King has done to himself is far from natural, and no primitive human ever looked like that. Quite possibly, at least in part, is a result of body dysmorphic disorder. That's my opinion, but I hope he talks to a professional about that. Muhammad Ali is a world-renowned champion with 56 wins and 5 losses. Two of the losses were after he already had symptomatic but undiagnosed Parkinson's disease. So technically, not even 5 losses. Do you think all of those wins are only due to his muscle strength? In 1974, the 32-year-old Ali beat the 25-year-old George Foreman in the 8th round. It's an incredible fight that my dad and I have watched together many times. George Foreman is six foot four and massive and a champion in his own rights. Ali is six three and was seven years older. Calculate that in dog years when it comes to competitive sports. Foreman was visibly bigger in the ring. Of course, Ali was physically strong and fast, which is imperative for a competitive boxer, but he needed a strong mindset to tire out the young brute force for eight rounds and then kick his ass. Much like Liver King, Muhammad Ali was an extrovert and an exhibitionist. So thankfully, there are many hours of him giving interviews. Although he has a colorful personality and a unique rhythmic style of speaking, if you keep watching his interviews long enough, after a while, you'll understand how his mind works, how much emphasis he has on his strength that has nothing to do with his athletic abilities. He's a perfect role model in that way. But if you want a man who is a role model as a husband, look elsewhere. You can't find one human being who is a perfect role model in all aspects. Pick what you like and leave what didn't work for him. It's not going to work for you either. What many people do with their role models is to either immortalize or demonize them. If you want to build a successful electric car company, you can look up to Elon Musk. But if you want to run a successful social media business, don't. If you're a fan of his, don't justify his misbehavior. If you're not a fan, don't deny his abilities and success in some areas because he has failed in others. Again, don't immortalize and justify and don't demonize and cancel. Allow humans to be faulty. Take what you like and leave what you don't. Henry Ford is far from perfect. I'm inspired by his tenacity and mindset and how he got around Goliath's legal opposition early on when he himself was a David. But he has done a number of other things later in life that I don't appreciate. That doesn't negate the good things for me. Another good example is what happened to Will Smith after the Oscar slap. Many people who liked and respected him had no room for him to screw up. He wasn't allowed, so they demonized and canceled him. On the other hand, some people kept their loyalty and justified, refused to acknowledge his misbehavior, and found a scapegoat, aka Jada, to blame. I discussed that in length in another episode. Be sure to check it out. If you're not into rich, muscular athletes, or even if you are, my suggest another role model, Mahatma Gandhi. He was a five foot five guy with pretty much no muscles. He was not a prime minister, king, army general, or president, just an anti colonial lawyer. Without picking up a gun or throwing a single punch, he threw the entire British Empire out of India and stopped them from sucking their blood and stealing their wealth. 
the unparalleled strength, resilience, courage, and leadership he showed is one for the ages. A role model doesn't always have to be a grand figure like Abraham Lincoln. It could be a young man in our society right now. Look at Ronan Farrow. He could never respect his father and rejected him as a role model, which in this case, I understand entirely. So he became a role model himself. The courage Ronan has repeatedly shown in his personal and career is inspirational. As promised, I'll tell you about my personal connection with Brian Johnson for transparency. When I was a teenager, even though I was healthy and energetic, there came a time that I couldn't get out of bed, and we found out that I was anemic. For years, I needed to take iron supplements daily, or I couldn't function. Then, as I got older, I realized I needed other supplements for optimal health. I've taken a long list of plant-based and food-based supplements for years, but I knew they were not nearly as helpful as I expected. The issue was low bioavailability. During the pandemic, I started doing a lot more research and stumbled upon a company called Ancestral Supplements. It had great reviews. Some of the reviewers even mentioned how great the company's owner is and how diligently he responds to every email with passion and care. I emailed him and sent a picture of my supplement cabinet with a ridiculous number of expensive and shiny bottles that were not worth a damn in practice. I told him I'm not going to throw all these out and buy all your products. Suggest just one thing from your line, and if it works, I'll gradually replace my stuff as they run out with your products. He accepted the challenge, and we set out to do a one-year experiment. This guy was amazing. He cared like he was my older brother. He answered all my emails in just a few hours. He was as wonderful as all those other customers had mentioned. He suggested that I start with his liver formula. I took one a day for just a month. The effect was shocking. It changed my life in ways I never thought or expected. I felt like I took a magic pill. Everything I had chalked up to genetics or aging went away. I eat healthy and I don't drink alcohol, so I had no idea why a liver pill would make so much difference in areas that seemingly have nothing to do with liver function. I was encouraged and started increasing the dosage and added other formulas. I had been taking collagen supplements from a very famous doctor present all over TV and internet for 10 years. And although never saw any changes outwardly, I'd hope that it was working. After switching to the ancestral supplements collagen for three weeks, my nails looked like fake nails in a good way. Something I've never experienced with 10 years of that fancy MD's collagen. The owner of the company, a.k.a. Brian Johnson, patiently helped me every step of the way and genuinely cared. He gave me recipes and encouraged me to increase my exercise in ways that worked for me. I asked him why he created this company, and he told me about how his sons were sick when they were little and he realized the food they were eating was harming them. I wholeheartedly believed everything he told me, and still do. He told me that he calls himself Liver King because he believes in it so much, but please don't tell his wife because she doesn't like it. I googled Liver King and there was literally one picture of him out there at the time. Within several months, my extensive supplement cabinet was cleared of hundreds of useless bottles and replaced with only a few incredible ancestral supplement bottles. I was feeling great and didn't need Brian's help anymore and lost touch. A few weeks ago, I was listening to John Stewart's podcast and heard about the Liver King, and the rest is history. Brian Johnson, and not the Liver King, is a great man. He is genuinely a caring and decent human being who believes in his product and ancestral diet, but definitely got carried away in the most heartbreaking way. It's a tragedy what's happening, and I hope he resolves his trauma and his rough patch ends. I just hope there is no irreparable damage to his relationship with his sons and his amazing wife in the long run. Regrettably, I don't think he has hit rock bottom yet. 
after his apology video he put on a show for TMC, lifting weights in the middle of Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles. I hope I'm dead wrong, but looks like he has upped his theatrics. Anyway, I'm still a happily paying customer and take my supplements and believe in the quality and the promises of this uniquely wonderful company. One last thing. If you're some kind of public figure, which is dime a dozen in this day and age, if you fuck up, either trump it, totally deny facts, call fact checkers fake news, and out stamina millions of people half your age and wear them out. And the right kind of crowd for you will respect you. But if you're genuinely sorry, offer a sincere and believable apology that won't rub people the wrong way. A genuine apology is also followed by accountability and showing how you learned from your mistakes and how to use the lessons you've learned to grow and better yourself. Or if you don't want to do that, disappear from public eyes. But whatever you do, don't half-ass it. Like the buffoon con artist George Santos, the congressman from New York's 3rd District, who fabricated a complete persona connected heroically to every major tragedy from the Holocaust to September 11th to the Pulse nightclub shooting, and then when outed, told Tulsa Gabbard that his resume is debatable. No, you little bitch. You either went to NYU or you didn't. Your family is either Catholic from Brazil or Jewish Holocaust survivors from Ukraine. It's not debatable. When you do that, no one will respect you, and you're a laughing stock. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, my lovely friends. And if you'd be so kind, please write a review and share this episode of the Secure Masculinity Podcast with a friend or two. Just grab the link and text it to them. And they might find it just as valuable as you have. Which, of course, I hope you have. (laughs) Thanks again for being here. And I will see you right here next time. See you soon.